Okay, we are in Leviticus 25, everybody. And the blessing over the reading of the Torah, if you would join me. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bakar Venu Mikol Hamin Venatan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Atah Adonai Noten HaTorah Amen Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all the peoples and gave to us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. In Leviticus 25, in verse 1, it begins with, Adonai spoke to Moshe on Mount Sinai. He said, tell the people of Israel, when you enter the land I am giving you, the land itself is to observe a Shabbat rest for Adonai. Six years you will sow your field. Six years you will prune your grapevines and gather their produce. But in the seventh year is to be a Shabbat of complete rest for the land. A Shabbat for Adonai. You will neither sow your field nor prune your grapevines. You are not to harvest what grows by itself from the seeds left by your previous harvest. And you are not to gather the grapes of your untended vine. It is to be a year of complete rest for the land. But what the land produces during the year of Shabbat will be food for all of you. You, your servant, your maid, your employee, anyone living near you, your livestock and the wild animals on your land, everything the land produces may be used for, for food. Now the reading after, or the blessing after the reading of the Torah, if you join me. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher natan lanu Torah imet vechaye olam natavotekenu baruch atah donai notein ha Torah amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and planted everlasting life within us. Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Kevin. Can you guys get something to read it? Like where you do the overhead. We don't have the overhead. We could use mine. If you know. No, but we, we do have it. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Welcome to today's Torah study. Um, the, well, uh, the parasha is called Bahar, okay? And Bahar means on the mount. So that'll be your first uh, fill-in in Roman numeral one. Bahar means on the mount. And this is taken from the first sentence we read in Leviticus 25 and verse one. It says, the Lord then spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai saying, and it, just, and it goes on. On the mountain of Mount Sinai, to think that the Lord only gave Moses, and there's many people, especially in the Christian church, who believe that all Moses received was 10 commandments on Mount Sinai. And all they have to do is read further down and right here in Leviticus, right off the bat, we, re we read how uh, the Lord gave this, these commands to Moses on Mount Sinai. So it may not have been all 613, which I believe that's exactly what it is. All 613 were given to him on Mount Sinai, but at least we know majority. Okay, uh, we know as we go through the Torah that the Lord gave much more to Moses than just the Ten Commandments. God speaks to Moses the laws of the sabbatical year. And we're going to talk about that. Every seventh year, all work on the land should stop. 
and its produce becomes free for the taking for all. So uh, imagine a fence around your property, keeping everyone out and everything on your property, uh, on the farmland, that everything you produce year in and year out is yours. It's for consumption, it's for, for sale. Uh, but in the seventh year, either the fence opens up or the fence comes down because now anyone is allowed to come on your property and take whatever they like. So uh, I say that because I know that it, with Peggy and I, uh, the other day when we were leaving to go to work, we pulled off to the side because we saw three deer on, on somebody's property and they have apple trees. Yeah. Oh yeah. So the deer were there having a feast, you know, and, and I thought about it because there are many people who believe that this year we are in a sabbatical year that, uh, uh, our 2022 and on our calendar is a sabbatical year. Uh, it may, it may not be, but I, I was thinking, well, you know, these deer, hey, they're free to get on that property and take whatever they want. <laughs> but, and they did. Yeah, we took pictures and we sent them out to all our kids. And oh man, you know, one of, you know, four of our kids, they left the mountain. They couldn't get off the mountain quickly enough. Your daughter, yeah. You know, one, she will never leave the mountain. But uh, but the four that left, you know, they send response. Oh, that's what I miss about the mountains. And, you know. <laughs> but, uh, okay. But like I said, in a sabbatical year, every it's free for all. Uh, you know, it, uh, the... The people of the land, the sojourners, uh, the, it tells you the wild beast, it, it's opened up and you can't stop it. You, you know, if you're going to obey the Lord, this is what you're going to do. So seven sabbatical cycles, what we're also going to cover is seven sabbatical cycles, cycles are followed by a 50th year, the Jubilee year, on which work on the land stops. All purchased servants, slaves, are set free in all ancestral estates in the Holy Land. If, if you sold property uh, to somebody, well, now that property reverts back to the original owner. You know, I, Peggy, I say amen to that, but boy, we'd inherit a nice, we'd inherit a nice house in Thousand Oaks, huh? <laughs> yeah, because yeah. yeah, we we bought a you know remember the, the time when there was track homes and you go in there and you collect you select the carpet and all this other stuff well we did that way up the, out the thousand oaks and those homes are worth a pretty penny now so okay in torah we read that god gave israel a very special law regarding the land okay there is no, I don't know of any other country that had laws like this. Uh, I mean, I know England has, you know, it seems like the king and queen own everything. And when you purchase something, you're only purchasing it until, you know, I guess your death or something like that, because then it goes right back. But uh, Indian property. Indian property? Okay, India. Oh, all right. Buy it for a certain amount of years, but then it reverts back to the Indian. It reverts back, yeah. Okay, so there, so there is, and I wonder if they get this directly from Torah. I mean, who knows? But, but this commandment will allow the land to rest every seven years. So every seven years, we are to just let the land rest. Okay, we'll get there. <laughs> when Israel observed this <laughs> when Israel observed this commandment the land would rejuvenate itself okay that's the reason to to let it rest now think about it uh the Lord gave a command telling the people to rest on the Shabbat six days of work and then a day of rest to rejuvenate yourself, okay? Uh, when the ground is resting, it gave a farmer or a family 
uh, who owned the land a chance to do other things. Okay, and and one of the, and what the rabbis say is that it would give them a chance to uh, to uh, just work the farm in a sense, like if you got fences that need to be uh, fixed or the barn or whatever, those are things you can do. But other rabbis say no, that they would not even do that, that they would be put their face into the Torah. They gave them a chance to uh, study, study the word. But the, the whole idea, Maria, Maria asked why do they do, they do this? They let the land rest. And it's the, the Lord commanded that the land needs a rest. And we're going to cover a time what happened to uh, the Israelites because they didn't let the land have this rest. But uh, he commanded it. So the, the land just needs to, well, it's six years of producing and producing and producing. And it's like, you know, I'm tired. You know, let me relax for a year and then we'll get right back at it again. But, but that's the reason why. So the land could rejuvenate itself. Why don't you share it? Use your your. <laughs> Maria didn't like my explanation, so she's gonna cut. <laughs> Go ahead, Maria. Outside of, of rejuvenating the land, what I got from it was that God was trying to teach them to have faith and trust in him oh yeah that he would provide for them for the years that they they would not be working the land yeah they would have to depend on him and him alone amen in fact you know i'll i'll cover that later on in this uh okay. torah study but you're <laughs> but you're absolutely right i mean when you do something like this you have to be trusting the lord amen You've got Amen. to be, you know, if you're not trusting the Lord, well, then you're not going to let the land rest. And then you got to suffer the consequences. So, but, uh, do they, do they still do that in I, 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 my next paragraph is you may ask if this is practiced today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it is practiced, uh, you know, I put down, you may ask if this is practice today. The answer is, yes, it is. It is practice, but not by many. I mean, not by the, the majority in Israel, but it is practice. In fact, uh, I read an article um, about a farmer in uh, Israel that went to the land in 1950. And he has been observing this commandment ever since his family went into the land. He was just a small child at the time, but when he inherited the farm uh, from his parents, he again, he says, and up to this day, they always, uh, they always uh, rest on the, after the seventh year. So yes, it's still going on. In fact, uh, the rabbis say that during the, sh the, the Shemitah year, uh, there are certain places where they go and they, they uh, get the fruit and uh, the produce and stuff like that, and they'll only get it from farmers who are observing the Shemitah year, you know, so, uh, and, 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 it, and it, like anything else, it, remember what we said when it was Passover, like, what do they do with all their hamets or all their their the leaven and everything well they sell it to or they give it to a non-jew to hold on to it and then when the feast of unleavened bread is over then they go back and they bring it back they circle around it you know well they do the same thing here you know what they do is their property is uh given over to non-jews for one year and they go in and harvest the ground and everything <laughs> but the jews say hey you know i'm not you know I'm not doing anything. Well, yes, the land didn't rest. You're right. The land is not resting, you know, so they try to scoot around it some way, but, you know, you're not going to get around God's word, God's commandment. Uh, so God's commandment, and we'll let the land rest for seven years. Uh, like I said, I, about that one family, they've been doing it since 1950. In verse two, it says, when you come into the, the, the land, 
which I am going to give you, then the land shall have a Sabbath to the Lord. This is one of those commandments that is land dependent, okay? Uh, which means, according to this verse, only in Israel. Would it be a good practice outside of Israel? You know, I don't see why not. Especially if we are truly grafted into Israel, then we're going to take on all the commands that the Lord is giving Israel. You got a microphone there, Kathy? No. But, but in verse 2, remember, it says, when you come into the land. Okay, go ahead, Kathy. No, just turn it all the way up and start talking. Can you hear me? Yeah. Up where my sister lives in Northern Cal, there's a lot of vineyards, and they'll for a whole year not do anything. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and, but that's that's what the word says. And if and I don't know, are they observant? Uh, you know, I have no idea. I know up in her town there is a Jewish synagogue. Right. But I have no idea who actually owns them. Right. But to me, you know, like you're saying, biblically, it's just smart to let the land rest because your next crop is going to be 100% better. Yeah, I think so. And, and the thing is, you really have to trust. We're talking about trusting in the Lord because you let it rest. And the seventh year, you're just eating from the ground, whatever it produces. But then the next year after that, you know that you're still eating from the whatever it produced because now you're starting to plant again and and it's going to take a year or two or you know for that crop to grow pastor bruce you know, i was in agriculture for quite a while and uh in america the farmers have, have practiced that all the way up into about the 60s right so and uh, it was a common practice and if you didn't let the land rest completely, you would rotate the crops mm -hmm. because different crops use different minerals out of the earth. So it would replenish. Right. So it was a very common practice in America as well. Yeah. And I would think it would be a common practice because if we were founded under godly principles, especially uh, Torah, uh, obviously, you know, the Puritans, they probably practice a lot of these, uh, uh, observe a lot of these commandments. And I would think early on, maybe not today, but early on, yes, uh, you know, these commandments were observed. Go ahead, Maria. Another reason why I believe this came into effect is that God wanted to remind them that the land really did not belong to them, that it belonged to him. Amen. And Amen. that this is the rule that he wanted to for them to follow on his land. Amen. Amen. You know, and, and I think uh, when we discuss uh, all these commandments and uh, we're getting into the Torah and, and every parashah, you're absolutely right. It, it's all, it's the Lord, you know, who are you going to trust? And, um, and, you know, we need to trust him. Go ahead, Kathleen. Well, and then it's an obedience issue, right? Yes. Because it's like us with the Shabbat. Yeah. Resting this land, right? Amen. Amen. I mean, I think I make a comment about that because I think it's very critical for, for all, all of us when you can mm -hmm. be in Shabbat. I observe the Shabbat, Amen. you know, when you can. I realize there are times that are out of your control. Things happen. You're sick. If you're sick and you say, well, I can't make it, Pastor Vince, because uh, I'm sick. Well, I don't want you here when you're sick. <laughs> Get well. <laughs> you know? Get well. We'll pray for you, you know. But, uh, but yeah, but if, if you're, uh, you're going to take... Uh, you know, Disneyland over the Shabbat, uh, there's something wrong with that picture, you know, you can go, you can go six other days, so seven years, the land is to rest, uh, this also reminds us of the 
days and then we rest on the seventh day. But let's look at the word Shabbat. Uh, <clears throat> okay, Susan, I think we got it back. Okay, give me a thumbs up, Nancy, if you could hear me. Can thank anybody you. hear me out there? Okay, thank you. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. We're back then. Thank you, Pastor Vince. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, yeah. No, every now and then, I'm, I'm telling you, Zoom is great, but yeah. Zoom is also has its issues you know? yeah you know especially when when it uh, uploads itself and then all of a sudden it uploads itself and you're looking at a blank screen you know and but okay you guys this leviticus that we're talking about right here or this shabbat in leviticus 25 1 through 7 it's all about the land in fact it says the land is entitled to a sabbath rest as part of the Torah's commandments. If Israel disobeys the Torah and does not allow the land to rest, they will be punished by God, including, be, including being sent into exile, which they were. Okay, if you have your Bibles with you, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Second Chronicles chapter 36. If you don't have your Bibles with you, you might, might want to jot that down. You can read it later. And I'm going to read in verse 20 to 21. In 20, it's, it begins with, he took into exile those who had escaped from the sword to Babylon, and they were servants to him and to his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. Until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths, plural, all the days of its desolation, it kept the Sabbath until 70 years were complete. So what is that telling us? How many years or uh, how, many, how many sets of uh, seven didn't... Uh, the, the Israelites keep 70. They were put, they were sent into exile for 70 years. And uh, <clears throat> we don't read that in uh, Leviticus. Why? But we read it in Second Chronicles. So uh, because the Israelites did not observe the commandment for the land, they were punished for 70 years. It's not that man will rest from working the land it's that the land will rest from being worked and that was a quote by one of the rabbis okay man's job he says man's job is is, is simply to get out of the way <laughs> and let and allow the land to rest oh. yep it, yeah <laughs> you know well like you said yeah it's easier said than done but um uh, Let's see. The seventh year is called the Shemitah, okay, meaning to release. During the Shemitah, all outstanding debts debt were canceled. You would release those who owe you money. You know, I was also uh, reading during this uh, study that uh, a lot of times, you know, because we are even told, I think it's in Deuteronomy, Shemitah. Okay. Uh, well, let's let's do a fill in right now. Roman numeral one a. Moses speaks to the Israelites concerning the sabbatical year and the year of jubilee. Uh, Moses speaks to the Israelites concerning the sabbatical. That's the fill in year and the year of jubilee so the fill-ins are sabbatical and jubilee on the mount on the mount on the mount okay in roman numeral two 
Sabbath is the fill-in, Sabbath rest for the land. In, in letter A, every seven years, the land lies follow. follow. Seven is your fill-in. Then in letter B, a year's rest. The land can rejuvenate itself. Rejuvenate, that is the fill-in. Okay, I'm going to give you C and D, too, because I forgot about the fill-ins. In letter C, a commandment only in the land of Israel. And that's what Torah says here, that it's only when you come into the land. Okay, so only is the fill-in. And in letter D, everyone was free to eat from anyone's property the produce of the ground or from the trees. So free and produce are the fill-ins. Okay, now let me move on. And I, I don't know how you guys are spelling Shemitah, but what I have here is S-H-E-M-I-T-T-A-H -T -T -A for uh, Shemitah. Huh? I got two T's, yeah. Okay. Okay, you know, it took a lot of faith uh, to not work the land for a whole year. A farmer would wonder how he would feed his family, but we also read this in, uh, ch uh, in, in the chapter uh, because this question, uh, the Lord knew it was going to be asked. Well, hey, what am I going to do? Uh, it would be more than one year when you figure it out. You're right. But, but in, in uh, verse 20, in uh, Leviticus 25, 20, it says, but if you say, what are we going to eat in the seventh year? If we do not sow nor gather in our produce, then I will so order my blessing for you in the sixth year that it will bring forth the produce for three years. When you are sowing the eighth year, you can still eat old things from the produce eating the old until the ninth year when when its produce comes in so trusting in the lord just as maria was saying that that is really the the whole uh, idea of or of the whole command is to trust in the lord go ahead bonnie are jubilee years still celebrated over in israel you know, uh, yes, they are, but is it a true jubilee? We don't know. We don't know. They, I know that I was talking with uh, Maria, and she had something very interesting about 1948 because of a, a word in the Hebrew that was, that was changed up. You want to share that, Maria? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maria is being a pain today, everybody. <laughs> well, to answer Bonnie, the reason some of the rabbis don't want to celebrate it is because they say the 12 tribes are not, not in Israel, yep. that they're all scattered. But it's really in verse 10 where it says, uh, well, I'll read the whole verse. You shall thus consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release through the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a, a jubilee. jubilee for you. And each of you, this is where it is. You shall return to his own property and each of you shall return. The rabbis found that where it says you shall return was misspelled on purpose that they figured because it uh, it says that misspell first of all was missing a vav 
And when you add the words of the misspelled letters, it comes out to the Hebrew year of 5708, which is 1948, yeah. where it says, you shall return. And they figured that the missing Vav is for the 6 million Jews that will not return. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Right. That is, that was interesting when she shared that, especially 1948. There are many who believe that in 1948, that it started over again. So that would be like 1998 would have been in Jubilee. But, but you're right. They also believe that since all the tribes have not come home, uh, you cannot celebrate a Jubilee. There's others that believe in 1967, once they took control of the Temple Mount, then now that's where the counting began. So then 50 years after that would have been a Jubilee. But there's a, you know, I know that even uh, we went out and saw the uh, Jonathan Kahn uh, uh, movie or, and it was good. And, and he, he speaks of the Jubilee. He doesn't give an exact date, but, uh, but you know, that it, it's, hard, it's hard to know. But I do know that uh, they believe that we are in a, a Shemitah year right now. Now, you know, this farmer that I was telling you about, uh, <clears throat> he, will, he will work his land for six years and then let it rest on the seventh year. Um, but it didn't say anything about a Jubilee year because if they've been doing it since 1950, you know, at some time, they've reached that 50 years. But all they stressed is that every seven years, he lets the land, leaves the land alone, and then he'll start his crop again the following year. So, but, uh, but the, you know, that, that is interesting, you know, but the, the farmers who did not, or the farmers who did obey were blessed with a year off of work, the rabbis say that a Jew will study Torah on the Sabbath. And the seventh year would give a farmer plenty of extra time to study. The bottom, yeah, exactly. The bottom line here, I wonder if they're studying or going on vacation. I mean, I don't know. Just, <laughs> just saying, you know. The bottom line here is the Torah is teaching us to trust God. Rashi says, that the landowner may pull from the land and the trees everything he needs for himself and his family to eat. He just can't act as an owner of the produce for that year. So in other words, yes, it's like what we were saying earlier. If you have property, it's open to anyone to come in and to uh, eat off the land, eat off the trees, you know. In the sabbatical year, the land belongs to everyone equally, is what Rashi says. The rich, the poor, the free and slave, Jew and non-Jew alike. So, you know, I guess during that time, you can't take your shotgun out there and say, hey, get off my land. You know? <laughs> uh, no, that's not going to work. In, in Israel, it's not going to work. But... You weren't permitted to hoard food. You're right. You could not gather in the produce or whatever you can and then store it in the barn or store it somewhere. You know, you just had to trust the Lord. It's like uh, when they were in the wilderness, trusting in the Lord with the, with the manna. You know, don't take anything extra. Just take what you need for that day because the next day you come out, it's going to be there again. You know, and we are even told in Exodus that there were people who tried, they didn't, they didn't believe it. So on the seventh day, they went out, you know, and go ahead, Gary. How do you reconcile what Joseph did in Egypt for seven years in anticipation of seven years of famine? Right, right. Well, and you figure when Joseph, this was before these commandments were given. This was before Mount Sinai. So looking back to Joseph, the seven years, he was 
obedient to uh, to what to what the what the Lord uh, gave him in the yeah the vision and everything that that was given to him. He was obedient to it. I don't know if it has anything to do with uh, <clears throat> letting it sit. I think the main thing about Egypt is, uh, and we'll cover it later, is that, um, you know, we, the Jews were very well versed to slaves. And the reason is because they were slaves in Egypt, you know, so, you know, that's why there's a lot of things we're going to we cover that uh, this is why you're not supposed to treat a slave harshly. But as far as the, the seven years, uh, I even read that uh, when we were way back in that parasha, that uh, during that time, yes, it was seven years of harvest because then it was going to be seven years of famine, but that because of their faithfulness and everything, it didn't go the whole seven years. Go ahead, Maria. I read where it said the sages said that God, if you keep these commandments that God would uh, promise to provide harvest for the three years. Yep. And he also promised that everyone would feel when they would eat, they would feel satisfied, just like when you eat the, the oh. show bread. Yeah. You eat just a little bit and the priest would feel full. Right. That's what they would feel, that the land will be kept safe from the enemies at this time and they also predicted that the messiah would be coming yeah. at the shmitsa year at the end of the year and that's it and that is is a well well known amongst the rabbis that when the messiah comes he's going to be coming on a shmitsa year Essentially, wouldn't it be uh, uh, ju 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 jubilee, jubilee together. come together kind yeah like the Havdala. yeah yeah a jubilee and and that and that's exactly it. That he's not a shemitah, but he's going to come back on a jubilee. So, uh, but I like what you're saying because, uh, and, and you're right. You know, with us, uh, with our obedience and doing what the Lord, what the Lord says to do, we're going to be blessed. You know, the the people were blessed. You know, be, to be given the food for uh, more than that one year time span or that what was there uh, so that doesn't that say that when the time our time of trouble comes god would do the same thing instead of us trying to hoard the food now because yeah. of the famine or the empty shells that they're going to have we're not trusting in god um i don't you know remember we're outside the land so uh you know, I think we have to use a little wisdom too. Yeah. Yeah. Look Not at when it crowds your mind. That's yeah. all you think about. Yeah. Oh. oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, because you know, and like uh, Kathleen was saying, you know, Joseph did, but I realized that was in Egypt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it was outside the land, mm -hmm. but uh, so the wisdom was let's store up and be prepared. You know, and that's exactly what Joseph did. And uh, Egypt prospered from it. How did they prosper? Well, people would come in and sell their cattle, their land, everything they owned so they could have food to eat. You know, Pastor Bruce? Yeah, the, the word says, uh, having done all, stand firm. So I think that we are to use our, our wisdom to whatever degree we have to do everything we can and then you stand firm. I mean, even we uh, obviously human beings can take everything way too far. And, and we do because we're radical. Human beings are radical things. And so we always go, the pendulum always swings too far, either direction, doesn't matter. Yeah. And uh, I think when it comes to prepping, you cannot prep for all the eventualities that are possible. Yeah. It, it's not even possible to do that. Store for us. You don't know what's coming. Uh, so how do you prepare for that? Well, you do the best you can. You use your wisdom and you, and you, and it's not a lack of faith. 
and and you know people that are all amped out on faith will tell you well just trust in god well these will be the very people that are knocking on your door when there's no food yeah. and if you say you know where's your faith they're gonna say how dare you say that to me brother <laughs> you know what i mean uh, i've been in this business a long time this is how it's going to work yeah. so you prepare now uh to the best of your ability and then you having done all then you trust god and he will get you through it and i, I share all the time I believe the day is literally coming when man will not live by bread alone, but by the very word. So if you're studying the word, you actually will be feeding your body. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I believe that that is to be taken, that scripture is to be taken both literally and spiritually. Yeah. 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 It's just that I think that sometimes we get this uh, chicken little syndrome of the sky is falling the sky is falling we gotta get food we gotta get food gotta get toilet paper and and wh what about the bible oh well i don't have time for that yeah you know yeah. And, and that that is a problem and, and you're right maria because uh you know uh that's a problem when you uh you i wonder if you're putting different idols in front of you mm -hmm. you know because the lord has got to be we've got to trust in his word go ahead kathleen it's, it's really balanced you know because it says proverbs 30 ants are creatures of little strength but they store up their food in the summer so it's yeah. wisdom and it's but it's balanced like you said not being yeah. extreme and making that your hope because that isn't our hope it can be gone tomorrow right you know he's our hope i'm in i'm in i'm always i'm always saying the most important thing we can do right now in preparation for the future is get strong with the Lord. I mean, that is, and that is in a ballpark all unto itself. If you're strong in the Lord, then God can send the ravens. He can do it, multiply the food. He can do whatever he wants to do. Right. And you just need to concentrate on being strong in the Lord because we're told that in these last days, there's going to be a falling away. Which means that many believers who think they're strong today are going to be proven to not be so strong. It's shaking. It's shaking. Everything yeah. can be shaken. And judgment begins right here. Right. In the house of the Lord. So getting strong in the Lord is ab absolutely the most important arena of preparation you can Amen. be doing right now. I'm in. I'm in. Go ahead, Gary. It's Proverbs 33. Oh, or 33 to uh, yeah, I put it on my book, but a, a wise man foresees the evil and prepares himself. Yeah. The foolish continue on and they are punished. When it talks about prepares himself, and I agree with Pastor Bruce, you know, you can do a lot of time and devotion expense to physical preparing. Right. But What's really important is the spiritual preparing. Because right. you may have all the food in the world, but if you're not spiritually prepared for what's coming, right. it's not going to do you much good. That's most important. You're right. You know, just like you know, warrior training. You have to train spiritually, physically, mentally, and emotionally. Yeah. Yeah. With the emphasis on the spiritual. Right. You know, you watch a lot of these prepper channels, very few of them address that. Uh, yeah, lots of good ideas, this, that, or whatever. But again, I'd have to agree with Pastor Bruce in the sense you do the best that you can, right, with what you have according to whatever wisdom you wish to apply. But when it's all said and done, you have to have the trust and the faith in the Father. And if you don't start practicing or exercising yeah. that now, just like with working out, right. you know, if that aspect of your life is atrophied, you're not going to be in shape when times do get difficult and tough. Right. Because if you can't have the trust and faith for God to provide and take care of you now, when it's relatively easy. Right. When it gets really, really bad, your spirit, you're going to be so spiritually atrophied. Uh, you're really going to be a, a certain creep without a pal. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Okay, let's move on. Uh, but we are reminded that everything belongs to the Lord. I think a couple people said that already. 
uh, and that's in Psalm, uh, Psalm uh, 24, 1. The earth is the Lord and all it contains, the world and those who live in it. So if we understand that, that everything that, uh, everything that goes on, uh, the bottom line is the Lord owns it, you know, he, but then he has commandments. His word says to do certain things. Yes, he owns it. And if you want to live in his word, uh, live in his world or his land, according to his word, we need to obey what he says. So like I said before, it would take a lot of faith to work the land six years and then let it stand idle the seventh year. Uh, it's not that it, it's not that exactly what the Lord wants from his people, what he wants from his feet, from his people to have faith in him. That is the bottom line, faith in him. Okay, let's move on to Leviticus 25, 8. In Leviticus 25, 8, it says, you are also to count off seven Sabbaths of years. Uh, for yourself seven times seven years so that you have the time so you have the time of the seven sabbaths of years that is 49 years okay the sabbatical year occurred once every seven years god commanded the israelites to count off seven full sabbatical cycles and you know seven times seven equals 49 years the 50th year was called a Yovel. Our English Bibles say Jubilee. Do, do any of you have Yovel in your uh, Bible? Okay. Okay. And I know the way I, I got it spelled is in uh, Roman numeral three. Uh, that's wrong? Oh, I took it straight from. Uh, yeah, but I got that from a commentary. So. Uh, the fiftieth year is the Yovel, the the year of jubilee. But you're right. At at uh, eleven twelve o'clock at night, I may have misspelled it. <laughs> <laughs> Yovel, spell it, Peggy. Okay, Y O V E L. So that your fill in for Roman numeral three. 50th year is the Yovel, the year of Jubilee. Okay. <clears throat> Just like the sabbatical year, during the year of Jubilee, there would be no harvesting of the land. When the Jubilee comes, debts, debts are uh, forgiven, loans are canceled, slaves are released, and property returns to the original family owner you know uh, oh yeah never uh that would <laughs> you know and and this would happen it says during during the day of atonement it says this in numbers uh, 36 4 if you want to write that down the blowing of a ram's horn would indicate the start of the year of jubilee the Israelites would dedicate this year uh, of rest to God, acknowledging that God would provide for their needs. In Roman numeral 3a, everything is returned to the original. Everything is restored. So during that time, if you lost something or if you sold something because of poverty or something that has hit your family uh at this time everything is restored back you know people will say well that's not right you know what if you bought the property and you didn't know it but it was like in the you know 38th year and then 12 you only have the land for 12 years and then it goes right back well yeah but what happens is i i explain it this way let's just say that the property costs a, a dollar so you're going to pay fifty dollars at the beginning of the very first year if you're 38 years into it well now you're only going to pay twelve dollars so you're paying a lesser amount because it's going to you're only going to have the land for a, a for that amount of time so 
Go, they know going into that? I think they would know going into it. Yeah, it, it's prorated, exactly. Go ahead, uh, Keila. No, I, this is just a thought. I, I, this, what you're saying, everything is restored. So that will be a jubilee year when, when, the, Lord re, when the Lord restores everything? Yeah, it will be a jubilee. And think about it. Think about, about our... Uh, yeah, I mean us, the Lord being being well being sinful people that we are, and then the Lord comes back and we're cleansed of all. Yes, go ahead. Does that mean they go back to their first spouse? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I don't know if you heard that out there, but <laughs> the comment came in. Does that mean you go back to your first spouse? <laughs> no, that was that, that is funny <laughs> but uh you know praise god for for us that the long marriages you know <laughs> to one woman <laughs> but according to leviticus 25 9 a loud trumpet will 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 proclaim liberty throughout the country on the 10th day of the seventh month. So the 10th day of the seventh month, uh, and this would be after seven Sabbaths of year, 49 years. In this manner, every 50th year would be a Jubilee year. And like I said, all real, all real property would automatically revert to its original owner. But what day, I mean, what day would this be then? The, the seventh month on the 10th day. That would be, you got it, Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement. You're, you're right. So all, like I said, and when you read about it, it automatically goes back and you read that in Leviticus 25.10. In 25.10, it says, you shall thus consecrate the 50th year and proclaim a release through the land in all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you shall return to its own property, and each of you shall return to his family. Now, now, th now then, if you drop further down, to, huh? Oh, go ahead. I was just going to share, you know, uh, in the book we're reading, uh, I wrote in there that uh, the counting of the Omer is like a mini jubilee. Yes, yes. yes. It's 49 and then 50. Mm -hmm. So it, so, and we can treat that and I, and I write this in the introduction as well we can treat that as we really can can receive something of a jubilee every 50 days right so oh, yeah um that's a pattern that's set forth 49 50 49 50 seven sabbaths 50 amen amen but you know and, and when you're i don't know if you read this ahead of time or before you know but when you read the parasha and you read this that was the first thing that jumped out to me. Is it a coincidence that we are in this parasha during the counting of the Omer? Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. Not at all. There, it, 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 it goes right in line with, with counting the Omer or counting the Omer goes right in line with this parasha, you know, but, but that, that's exactly it. But the portion, what's that, Kathy? So does that mean that the United States will now become or go back to the Native Americans? You know. Oh, I'm just kidding. Well, I'm okay with that because yeah. what is it? What do I have, Peggy? 18%? <laughs> <laughs> when I did You're uh, hoping. hoping. Yeah, I'm hoping. <laughs> but I've always shared that when uh when I did my DNA and everything, it said 18% Hopi Indian. Yeah. And I told my brother, I said, man, I'm 18%. He said, well, don't be so thrilled about that. The Hopi Indians are the only Indian tribe in the country that doesn't own any casinos. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. But they own casinos. <laughs> <laughs> hey, <what are> you <laughs> <doing>? <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so in 2510, it, it says that uh, each of you will return to his family. But if you jump down to 13, it also says, on this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his own property. So when you, when you start uh, saying this multiple times, it's important. These are things that are going to happen. We run, we run into that later on, too. And it says, those who were living in, a, in poverty and had sold themselves as slaves to their brother should regain their liberty. And we just read that in 2510. But if you drop down to 2539, it says, if a countryman of yours becomes so poor with regard to you that he sells himself to you, you shall not subject him to a slave service. So all this is, when we get there, what that is telling you is that if he's a countryman, he isn't treated as a slave like you were treated in Egypt. He is going to be treated more as a hired servant. And, and it's uh, when we're talking about the prodigal son, what did the prodigal son say? I just want to go back home and be with my dad because if he just hires me as a, as a hired servant, I'll be better off with him than I would be out here, you know. And you'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> you'll <laughs> go ahead, Maria. We're trying to hide it from you, Maria. <laughs> when I studied this, I finally really understood. When Yeshua stood up in the, in the synagogue and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach to the, the, the gospel to the poor. Right. He has sent me to proclaim the release of the captives Amen. to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord Amen. as the year of Jubilee. The year of Amen. Jubilee, yeah. See, I was going to read that later, Maria, but I'm glad you read it now. Well. <laughs> Thank you so much. All the time. Which is great, which is great. One thing, if, you know, one thing about Maria, whenever we have a Torah study, she is in the word reading it. So, you know, there's. It took me eight years. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. What's what's that? Better late than never. To understand what was going on. Yeah, but you know what? We're we're all in the same boat, Maria. Every one of us. How many years did it take us that the very first time you read a uh, Torah portion? Uh, it's like, man, what is the Lord saying here? Eight years later, you know what the Lord is saying, you know, and now you're coming into, uh, you know, different ideas and, you know, you understand. Go ahead, uh, Pastor Bruce. I, I just want to take a minute to uh, say this about Maria. Maria is a real student of the word. I mean, and I really mean. salute that because I wish everyone in the congregation was the student you are. Yeah. Uh, no. You know, you know why? We're going to get into dueling <laughs> lights here. Now. Yeah, you know why? You know why? Because 15 years ago, you said. No. <laughs> when I first came here, I really didn't understand what you guys were trying to teach. And it went right over my head like this verse. How many times have I read this? He stood up to read and I proclaimed. I, I didn't know that until... Yeah. Now, when I studied yeah. it, what, 10 years later? About time. Really. Yeah. <laughs> and then after you, you, you started teaching, I said, oh, and I wrote it down. Yeah. Yeah. And then after about four or five years, I said, okay, now I'm going to go yeah. over and I'm going to try to top what you said. <laughs> so give me another eight years, Lord willing, and the creek won't rise. I'm in. I'll be I'm up in. there teaching. I'm in. Okay, in Roman numeral three, <laughs> Roman numeral three, B, the day during the day of atonement, the blowing of the ram's horn would indicate the start of the year of Jubilee. 
So atonement and uh, indicate are your feelings. And then I wanted to share with you in letter C. Yeah, atonement and indicate are the feelings. Then I want to share you share with you in letter C. Uh, it says in tw in uh, twenty five ten, and we we read that. You shall thus consecrate the fiftieth year and proclaim a release through the land of all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and each of you shall return to his own property, and each shall each of you shall return to his family. There is a very important uh, thing in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, that has this inscription written on it. Does anybody know what it is? The Liberty Bell. The Liberty Bell. So in Roman, in uh, letter C, Leviticus 2510 is written on the Liberty Bell. And you and to think that those left, those left li uh, liberal idiots, don't think uh, our country had any any foundation in the Lord, you know. So uh, it's twenty five ten is written on the Liberty Bell. So, Amen, Amen. Okay, so let's yes, yes, Lucy. Or it says that each of you shall return to this family. More depth to that than you know. Didn't you, when you read, and I was thinking this is a, what they, they, they believe that this came to our senior pastor that the prodigals are coming home. When I read that, I thought, oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that is good. It, I well, it, well, it, you know, because you're separated. You know, granted, maybe at this time there was a reason why they were separated because of a uh, of a famine or whatever, and they sold themselves into slavery or whatever. But now that the uh, the it's a shemitah year or it, it if it's a jubilee year, they re, they all return home. They return to their original family. I read that and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, we've been praying for our prodigals and maybe last year wasn't the right time or the year before, but now is the right time. And like I said before, we're reading this portion, we're reading it at this time of the year. We are in the counting of the Omer. You know, there is not, uh, it's not a coincidence. You know, and I think uh, Jonathan Kahn uh, put that in very good perspective, you know, that these aren't coincidence that these things are happening, you know, they are happening at the right time that the Lord had prescribed, okay, and, and that, and I believe you're right, I believe that there is more there than what we're just reading, because like Maria said before, you know, eight years ago, and each of you shall return to his family. Yeah, okay, let's let's move on. Mm -hmm. No, there's more there. Mm -hmm. I think that our prodigals are coming home. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Okay, Amen. I think Amen. you're next, Deborah. Okay. Okay. So Go ahead. I have a question. Um, for like today. Uh huh. And how um, like back in the day, families grew up all in the same town, all your relatives live there. But today, everybody is like separated everywhere. I don't even know who all my family is. I've met most of them or some of them through Facebook. Oh. So it's like, I don't even know like my family lineage or anything. Yeah. I don't really know all that. It wasn't yeah. really talked about. So do you think that um, what she said, maybe it's more than that, yeah. maybe, um, it will be like I think it's getting gonna, to know your fa whole family. I heard a praise report today from my sister Kathy, and it's and, and and I've been hearing praise reports like this all over that children are calling in. 
okay, yes, they may be scattered, but they're calling in. For Kathy, she has a daughter that wants to talk to her and have a Bible study with her mom. Praise God. You know, there's, there's things. That's the return. Yeah. Yeah, we were, we were given a praise report about our grandson in school. Um, uh, I'm going to say Miss Goble. Miss Goble, uh, Janie. She told you? Yeah. That here he is speaking, talking about the Lord and his friends go up to him because Isaiah knows. He knows, you know, and I do know that my kids, when they go to bed at night, they say the Shema. I don't know if they truly understand it, but they do say the Shema, you know. He learned the Jewish prayers. From his he used, a, he said he used, learned all his, yeah. the Jewish prayers from his grandparents. And Peggy and I were talking about it during Hanukkah. There was a couple evenings we weren't home. We didn't get home till very late, but the evening came. And Isaiah lit the Hanukkah candles. Yeah. So I think, wait, I think Kathy was, no, Maria was next. I just wanted to say that uh, we know that when a Jew, uh, Jewish or Hebrew person sold themselves into slavery, if they loved their master, they would say, I want to stay with you. And yes. they would be yeah. peers. Yes. Yeah, well, in the year of Jubilee, the 49th year, when that came around, they were then given a choice again if they wanted to leave. And if they wanted to leave after that time, they were allowed to leave. They were yeah. allowed to break that pledge. Yeah. And I think a wonderful thing about the laws in Israel, if you left, you weren't left empty handed. Right. You know, they supplied whoever owned you would supply and give you so you don't go out there out on the street with nothing. You have something to get started. I think, Kathy, were you ne you were next after that? I was just going to say what you did. Oh, OK. What about your daughter? Oh, I should have let you take care of that. Yeah. yeah. OK, go ahead, Tila. No, another another praise report. As I was leaving yesterday from, from church, um, there was a young couple, and I know who they were, but I can't, I, it's not right for me to say their names. But anyway, they'd never been, they'd never been there before. And she turned to him and she said, what did you think? And he said, this was really good. It was much better than what mom said. And so, you know, so I, I was very excited. I haven't had, been able to, ch to share with the, with the mom yet yeah. of, of what they said. But I just got so excited because they experience, you know, what they oh, experience in their, and they are prodigals. They are prodigals. Oh, and that's why I was really excited. Yeah. yeah. Praise God. We need these praise reports coming in because yeah. there's people that are, as we get closer to the 50 days, there's people that are getting nervous that maybe that's not a word from the Lord. Oh, no. Maybe, right. maybe uh, it won't happen the way we're hoping. You know what? We need to encourage each other. All the more as we see the day approaching, and this day is coming, oh, yeah. and this is going to be a release. It's not the it's not the conclusion. It's the beginning. Yes. You know, and one thing I want all of you to understand. I mean, we we always announce. We say if you have a praise report, let a pastor or an elder know, or or you could put it in the box. You know, and it's not that uh, we we want we don't want you coming forward and giving the praise report. We are getting we are getting big, and we need to uh, we need to keep order. That's probably the best way of putting it. And by keeping order, um, you know, it, it praise God if we have a a two hour service of just praise reports, you know. But yeah, <laughs> but but you know, but then we won't get into a teaching. We won't get into worship and and, and things like that. We're just. Yeah. Oh, we're going to have worship. Absolutely. You know, you know, because praise God, even when we didn't have a, you know, Kathleen, Kathleen is a worship leader. Yeah. You know, I, you know, if you haven't noticed that, I don't know where you've been, but she is a worship leader. And praise God that when she left, we were able to get by for that weekend. You know, the Lord, the Lord met us. Amen. Are we prodigals? Huh? Are we on prodigals? I don't. I don't know if you would call this a praise report, but it's on 
a return prodigal uh -huh. that uh, someone came up to the prodigal i don't want to name names and said oh i'm so glad to see you have has all the evilness come out of you oh. now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah well you know what uh i mean i know what you're saying because we you know and then you then one thing because i know that something was given to us and uh we didn't bear witness with it and if you don't bear witness with a uh, a word that's given to you you don't accept it i don't bear witness with it it might be for someone else but that wasn't for us you know, and, and you move on, you know, for somebody, you know, uh, words of edification is what the word tells us to give one another, you know, and so I say that if, if you can't give a word of edification, you know, don't give a word at all, you know, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Bonnie. I think not only are praise reports um, encouraging, I think words of encouragement are important too. I was just thinking when my daughter graduated from high school, I had to take her up to college and I was supposed to leave that Friday and Monday I had like, I, okay, let's just say $7 to my name. Wednesday, a friend of mine came over to my house and she gave me this card to read. And then she said, okay, here, open this. And it was like one of those tall wine boxes that you put wine in. Yeah. I opened it, turned it upside down and it was full of cash. Oh my God. She had gone Good. to my coworkers, her coworkers. She took our, both our daughter's yearbook and my daughter had this full page colored picture of her in it. And she said, look at this beautiful girl. Her mother needs help because I had just been laid off. I counted it up and it came, I'd say close to a thousand dollars. I had enough to rent a car, rent yeah. a hotel, get her some things she needed for her room and still have gas money to come back. So Amen. I think words of praise reports are not only important but words of encouragement amen 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 does somebody want to say something over the on online peggy i i, I see kent oh well, yeah okay kent he doesn't have his hands up though. yeah <laughs> kent did you want to say something kent 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 un unmute yourself and then peggy turn up your volume hello Oh, I, I, I got it here. Ryan. Yeah, go ahead, Kent. Uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, we all uh, are studying the Bible and everything. And in the Bible, all of this land is Israel. Yeah. So obviously, if we support in any way any Palestinian state, it would be wrong because that would be the land that, that, uh, the land that God gave uh, 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 as you know, or you know, to them. So you know, as as the Arabs say, "la" means no. So it's just "la Palestine," no Palestine, right? I mean, right. Is oh, it, I, you know, is the there anybody is... here that agrees that there should be a Palestinian state? I mean, I'm not trying to get into a political conversation. I'm well, just saying what it says in the Bible. That's all. Well, then I'll answer your question. Does anybody here believe that there should be a Palestinian state? No. no. <laughs> yeah. Nobody oh, here. Right. Then the my belongs to Israel. That, then my second question, which is a little bit out there, is then don't you think Israel should also take back uh, the other land that it owns, which is Transjordan? Oh, then I, I, just I, I, like I Russia attacked Ukraine, he thinks he owns that. So Israel really owns Transjordan, or is that going too far? What do you think? Oh, well, no, no, no. I, I think you're 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 right on track, uh, uh, Kent. And what's going to happen when it's all said and done? 
the boundaries that you see along the Jordan River and, and where Israel is today, it's going to be probably 10, 15 times as big as that because Israel will be restored to its original uh, land ownership or condition and it's much it's much wider it's much vast than what it is now so yes uh, i believe that uh, it will be restored one day and uh, and maybe when my shiach comes back that's when it will be restored let me get uh, uh, lucy first she was go ahead lucy just real quick thank you kent like we talked about back to the point about uh, if we ever had a two hour uh, service with just praise reports, worship, it is a message. Yeah. It is, it is all of that. Yeah. yeah. It is another way to look at it. Yeah, I'm not saying it's not going to happen, yeah. but what we're just trying to do. There it is. Okay, but did I did we lose? Uh... Okay, no. Okay, good. Okay, uh, no. So so that that that's all I'm saying. That we're going to uh, you know we're just you know we want to keep like order, you know. So yeah, but we agree. Oh, we love praise reports. Go ahead, Pastor Bruce. Let me set the record straight. <laughs> you know you're <laughs> i was on a rant driving over here this morning uh because of ignorance it was a short ride but <laughs> i was i was going off the whole way <laughs> to, to kent's point he's absolutely right listen there's the palestinians already have a state mm -hmm. It's called Transjordan. Right. It was given to them years ago. Yep. And they got booted out by the Arabs right. because the Arabs hate the hate the Palestinians. Yeah. Israel took them out of the graciousness of their hearts, mm -hmm. brought them in, gave them full privilege as citizens of Israel, mm -hmm. and the world is so bloody ignorant. Yeah, boy. You go, Pastor. Go. And and I am sick and tired of it. Somebody needs to stand up and set the record straight and say, right. no, they already have a state, and it's ten times larger than Israel. Right. Yeah. It's half of Jordan. Yeah. Yep. Jordanians. Nobody, yeah. The Jordanians are there, but just Bedouins. Oh, okay. No one lives there because they don't but want no that. No, the Palestinians are all in Palestine. Yeah. See, I think one of the worst it's things, really crazy. one of the worst things that happened at the 67 war was when it was over, they were packing up to leave to go across the Jordan River. And there was the what's the general's name said, no, no, don't leave. Don't leave. Uh, we can all live here in peace together. He should have just let, let them leave. And uh, Israel would be much better off today uh, because of that. Well, that's that's my little two cents. Go, <laughs> go ahead, Frank. Yeah, and, and actually right now, uh, as far as this Ukrainian and Russian thing, Israel is taking a much more active role. They're going into Syria. And yes. And they're, uh, they're bombing targets because uh, the uh, enemy is uh, moving so closer and closer. Record, yep. closer, closer to the border. Yep. And they just wait till they move it in. The next day, they just go wipe them out with their jet. Yep. Yep. So that's uh, where I'm saying, well, the reason I'm saying that is yep. we must be really close to uh, a yep. point counter over there, like WW3. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it's getting very close. very close. You're right. Go ahead, Maria. Close to what the pastor said. Uh, in 1917, when they signed the Balfour Declaration, right. yes, the uh, English rule turned it over to, I guess, Israel. And someone predicted at the conference that 50 years from that 
year 1917, something was going to happen regarding the land. And in 1967, this, the war started and Israel got by mistake, but they got the mount and they got the, a, a couple of the other land, but because of pressure from the United States, they gave it back. And that was a no-no because it says in the Bible, the land is mine. Amen. And Amen. They, they gave it away. You know, but the thing is, you know, politicians get involved. So it's not that they gave it back really. I mean, did the did the United States uh, give them advice or pressure them? Yeah, they probably did. But they didn't have a uh, leader at the time that would say, you know, up yours. You know, we're not, you know, yeah. Yeah, I think we, they, if the Lord, if the Lord can give them victory in seven days, you know, so, yeah, you know, God, just one person in God will conquer a million man army. And the, and the one person, the Lord will probably say, stay out of the way. <laughs> yeah, I'll take care of it. Okay, so let's move on. In addition to this, the Jubilee year was to be observed after the manner of the sabbatical year. There should be neither sowing or reaping or pruning of vines, and everybody was expected to live on what the fields and the vineyards produced of themselves. <clears throat> they were not allowed to store up the products of the land, and that's what uh, Maria brought up. You couldn't hoard your your your, uh, your food, you know. The 50th year was to be a time in which liberty would be proclaimed to all inhabitants of the country, but this law was intended to benefit everyone. It wasn't just there to benefit the, the poor or the slaves. It was to benefit the the owners, the landowners, so it was there for everyone. The institution of the Jubilee, Jubilee year should, be, should become the means of fixing the price of real property. And we covered that, it's like prorated, okay? So moreover, it should include the possibility of, uh, there's always a possibility of selling any piece of land permanently in Leviticus 25, 23, the land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, but you're all but aliens and sojourners with me, okay? So we talked about that, where, uh, you know, if you purchase property, uh, you know, you might only own it for a, a certain amount of time, and then it reverts back to the original owner. So, you know, being an original, being in one of the original families, we talked about this, I think, in Exodus, was it, where uh, the, when they went into the land, you know, uh, the land was going to be divided amongst all the tribes. And then within the tribes, every family got a portion, you know. And to this day, that portion of land still belongs to that family. Is it recorded? I don't know. You know, I know that some people live in, in uh, areas that, they'll say that this goes all the way back to the time that the people came into the land, you know, but, uh, you know, I didn't do a full study on that. Okay, uh, let me give you, oh, go, go ahead. Your, your point, you know, we're told in Revelation that the books are open. Yeah. And no one has ever been able to uh, really fully disclose what books are we talking about. Right. We have a few ideas. But as you were just speaking, I, it just came to me. I wonder if there's a, a, a ledger of land ownership. No. Wow. Well, you know, it's just like, uh, you know, when we talk about the breed Hadesha, they always say how uh, it, was, it was written in Greek. It was written in Greek. No, it wasn't written in Greek. Originally, it was in Hebrew. The oldest uh, known copies of it is in Greek, but that doesn't mean the original is is in Greek. You know that's debatable, but I fully believe you got it. I think it's replacement theology. I re, I believe that it was all originally uh, written in Hebrew. Now, if somebody says, "Well, 
Aramaic, well, okay, maybe I can go that way, but not Greek, but not Greek. Okay, so, uh, so and, and like you said, replacement theology. So I think that when the books are open, will there be a book there that says that, uh, you know, uh, Frank Valenzuela, this property is yours because of your family going way, way back. And the trees will clap their hands. And the tree. And go, I didn't know we were on the property. In Hawaii? On one of the cliffs of Masada. No. <laughs> <laughs> the snake trail. Yeah, the snake trail. Yeah, that's right. Go ahead, Frank. Uh, I just I just thought of this right after you spoke about the Palestinian. What what exactly is a Palestinian if they're not a Arab? I I don't. I thought, they I thought they were a mix between a Jew and an Arab. They were the sojourners in the land at the time that did not leave. They have to give them a label, so they looked at uh, uh, Palestine, and uh, and they just went and they started started calling them Palestinians. Uh, so would they, they be like gypsies? At, you know, now, well, you know, with with Israel, Israel invited them in or let them stay. Wasn't you that know? Moshe Dayan that did that? That general? Was it, that that, I think it was even before Moshe died. Yeah, that was that was in uh, yeah. Moshe, Moshe Diane was in, in the 67 war. Right. Isn't that what we're he talking about? He was pretty young in 48. Yeah. Um, well, were you going all the way back to 48? No, I was thinking the 67. Oh, the six. Okay. Well, that was right. Moshe Diane. Yeah. Yeah. But let me address that on the, on the Palestinians. Uh, Palestinians were just the people that was the name, just like we're Americans. Yeah. It, it really doesn't matter what your heritage is. Uh, I get so tired of the blacks always saying, well, I'm an African-American. No, you're not. You're an American. Thank you. That's like me saying I'm a Scottish American. Who the heck cares? Yeah. I, I'm no more Scottish than, than, than Bonnie is African. Thank you. You, you know, I mean, and, and the Palestinians were just this group of people that lived in the land that was called Palestine. Yeah. Yeah. And it was it was Palestine up until 1948. Well, yeah. didn't the Romans when they conquered through the it was all called Palestine. Yeah, they and it was the name it, right? Yeah, that's because it was it, that's a derivative from the word Philistine. Right. So it's the Philistines were originally the occupants mm -hmm. of this area, modern-day Israel or Palestine. So the people that were living there were just called Palestinians. Right. So when Israel was given that land, the the uh, the authorities said, "Okay, what are we going to do with all the inhabitants here?" Because most of them weren't Jewish, and they said, "We're going to give them a parcel of land in Jordan that was it's huge." Yeah, much bigger and, than and Israel. They called that Trans Jordan. And they said, you guys can go over to Transjordan. Well, they migrated over to Transjordan because they didn't really like all the Jews that were coming in in 48. So they go to Transjordan. Well, the Arabs didn't like them. And they kicked them out. They treated them so poorly that they went back to Israel and, and the Israelis took care of them. I mean, we've been to Israel five times. We know a lot of uh, Palestinian uh you know, Israelis, I mean, Arab Israelis, they're great people and they love Israel. So when you, it's the politicians lying to us. When you go to Israel, you'll have a Jewish shop right next door to an Arab shop. Yeah. And they're best of friends. Yeah. Our bus driver was, uh, what was his name? I forget what his name was, but yeah. he was, uh, he he was, was, he was well, he was Arab. He was an Arab. Yeah. Great guy. <laughs> so I, I you know the politicians come in they they never know what they're talking about i mean come on they don't even know what a woman is <laughs> so why would we believe them on these difficult issues like the palestine state yeah they don't have a clue no they don't they don't too busy cashing their checks that's all they do <laughs> and both themselves raises yeah. peggy and i'm tired of it okay can unmute <laughs> Can't unmute yourself. Okay, am I unmuted? Yeah. Yes. Okay, 
1977, before any peace agreement with Arabs, with Egypt, uh, Anwar Sadat came to the Israeli Knesset and he referred to the land, which we call the West Bank, as Judea and Samaria. And he wasn't doing it to be polite because that is the legal and legitimate name of the area called the West Bank, okay? So he said Judea and Samaria. All this Palestine thing that is Arab is all relatively new. I mean, relatively, oh, yeah. you know, but in 1977, it was Judea and Samaria. That's right. And that's the correct name. You know? and, and you're right. right. And even now when they try to put housing in there, they don't say we're building housing in a, a Palestinian state or anything. We're putting housing in Samaria or, or Judea, yeah. you know? So, uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Ken. He was, but he was shot over this, this yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah, he was yeah. assassinated. Ooh. 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 Okay, let me move down, you guys, because I know I'm not going to finish up everything, but... Uh, <laughs> okay, in Roman numeral four, integrity in business in the land. So what the Lord is is looking at is not to uh, cut corners, kind of like what I told you earlier, what they do is uh, they say that during the Shemitah year, you know, we're going to let the Ar Arabs uh, come in and work the land, but, but we're not doing it, you know, kind of like, you know, not, you know, buying and selling on the Shabbat, but we'll have somebody else do it for, you know, so, uh, <clears throat> and uh, let's see where I'm at. Okay, the, the crowning feature, though, was the full restitution of all real property in the Jubilee year. Okay, everything returning back to uh, its uh, primary owner. Uh, and of, of course, you know, giving back the property to the family, which originally uh, possessed it, that was the big thing about uh, a, a Jubilee year. Okay, and the, and the slaves being set free you know, the people. Uh, the year of Jubilee is a great future era uh, prophecy, okay? And you will read that in Isaiah 61. Go to Isaiah 61. If you want to just jot it down, Isaiah 61. Oh, somebody's trying to get in. Okay. Yeah. Well, no, no, what happened? No, it's, it, you know what, it's Scott, uh, because they're driving, so they're probably, they probably lose it, and then they got it back again, and, you know, <laughs> so it's Isaiah 61, 1 to 3, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord anointed me to bring good news to the humble, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to captives, and freedom to prisoners to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn to grant those who mourn in Zion giving them a garland instead of ashes the oil of gladness instead of mourning the cloak of praise instead of it of a disheartened heart uh, spirit so they will be called oaks of righteousness the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. The Jubilee year being the crowning point of all sabbatical institutions gave the finishing touch as it were to the whole cycle of Sabbath days or months and years, you know, and that's it. You always have something and then it, it you know, just like for us, I think our big, we have all the festivals. And of all the festivals, you know, uh, we we have our uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, before that, with uh, Passover, then we get to uh, to Shavuot. There's the, you know you have Yom Kippur, you know uh, Yom Teruah. You have all these, and but and then we get to the Feast of Tabernacles. For me, the Feast of Tabernacles, I really believe, is going to be the ultimate. Because I really believe that is a time when the Mashiach is going to come back, when the Messiah comes back. 
And when the Messiah comes back, he's going to come to tabernacle with his people. So I may be wrong, just <laughs> but but to me it <laughs> but it's just a it's a wonderful picture of, of of the Lord being with His people. So uh, uh, you know that that you know I I love Suko. I love I I do love it. Okay, so the jubilee jubilee year, as I said, is the crowning point of all of of all of this. Uh, So it's you know it's quite appropriate then that it should be a uh, a year of rest, a year of uh, of studying Torah, of getting into the Word. But I think we should be doing that uh, every day. I think it's nice when they midrash. We call we talk about a midrash. This is a midrash what we're doing today. Uh, we're you guys are bringing in uh, comments and questions and and this is wonderful. You know that the uh, the rabbis. And the Jews, they do this every week. Mm -hmm. They will go into uh, uh, the synagogue on Shabbat and they have a Torah portion and they read it there. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the week, they start doing exactly what we're doing now. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Maria. This, this is the part that really got to me that can you just picture it? Yeshua comes into the synagogue and he says, I am your kinsman redeemer. I am the one that's bringing the land to you. I'm restoring your land. I'm giving you free. Can yeah. you imagine if somebody was to stand up in front of our congregation on Friday and say, I am your kinsman. I'm giving you back everything that you've lost. We would say, you're crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and they didn't, but he, that's what, when I saw that, I said, I, I, it took my breath away. You know, Maria, and to expound on that, not all of them were blind to it. Nicodemus saw it. Yes. Yeah. He you wasn't know? in that synagogue. He may not have been in that, but... But but the yeah. but he he knew exactly who Yeshua was because he says no one like you could come with those words if he wasn't sent from God and the works that you do and the works that you do exactly so so a lot of times you know like I say don't throw all the Pharisees to the to to the curb because uh, they're Paul the uh, Pharisee of Pharisee. See, sometimes, sometimes we have different understandings, you know, and, and we might not be all in agreement. You know, I, I don't really believe that Paul was a, was a, was a rabbi, uh, you know, and no time is he ever referred to as, as a, as a rabbi, you know, but that's just me. But, but um, is he the, I mean, to write, what, what did he write? Something like uh, three quarters of the Breed Hadashah, you know? <laughs> You know, it, I mean, it's amazing. You know, he was a servant. He was a servant of, of the Lord, you know, but uh, but there's things like, you know, like I was getting at is that, uh, but we can uh, understand the word and, and what it's saying. And, and there's and there's a, a lot, in, you know, we're growing. We're, we're continuing to grow. And now let me move on. Okay. <laughs> Before I, I know it. <laughs> Okay, well, we're going to talk about in uh, Leviticus 25, 18 to 22, it says, you shall therefore follow my statutes and keep my judgments so as to carry them out so that you may live securely on the land. Then the land will yield its produce so that you can eat your fill, fill and live securely on it. But if you say, what are we going to eat in the seventh year? If we, if we do not sow nor gather in our produce, then I will so order my blessing for you in the sixth year that it will bring forth the produce for three years. When you are sowing the eighth year, you can still eat old things. Okay, we read this earlier. Let the land rest would give a, a total of three years of food and only if the people would listen and obey the Lord. That was that was the thing. If you're going, if you're going to listen and obey him, then he is going to take care of you. Okay. 
And then in 29, it says, likewise, if a man sells a dwelling house in a walled city, when, it, when his redemption right remains valid until a full year after its sale, his right of redemption lasts a full year. But if it is not bought back for him within the space of a full year, then the house that is in the walled city passes permanently to its purchaser throughout his generation. It does not revert in the Jubilee. On the Sabbath year, all debts were canceled, but in the year of Jubilee, the Israelites, who has sold himself to another, is released, and the land which has been leased to another is restored to its original owner. We've covered that uh, in verse 23. Only houses which were in walled cities were exempt. And after a redemption period of one year, it became the permanent possession of the purchaser. Okay, that's a little, you know, we were wondering what, you know, what's going on here. I think that those who exert power would probably buy houses in walled cities and would buy as many as they could because walled in housing would become permanent housing that would eventually revert back to the purchaser. I say that because if we consider the widow's houses, which the scribes and the Pharisees were accused of devouring in Luke 1240, those houses were in walled cities. A widow would most likely want to live out her last days in a walled city for safety and security. And a Pharisee, well, especially a, a, a tricky or a Pharisee, would find a helpless widow as easy prey. The Lord sternly rebukes the Pharisees with the woe to you scriptures. Yeah. These were things that they knew the law. They knew it better than, uh, than, than most people. So, you know, if they knew that they could purchase a, a home in a walled city and, and, uh, and the kinsman redeemer did not come and or family did not come and, and get it back, well, then it's theirs forever, you know. So, so and, I, and I believe that that is why when we read about uh, Yeshua, we read how he rebukes the Pharisees. It was over stuff like this that was going on. But we already know that in the second temple, uh, thing weren't, that everything wasn't kosher on the temple mount. Things were happening that shouldn't have been happening. Go ahead, uh, Tila. Well, I know this is going to sound stupid, but because I, I, I don't know and I want to know. What about the Levites as far as they weren't given any land? So do, were they allowed to, to own houses and stuff? I mean, did they buy? They were well taken care of. Yes, they, uh, yes, they did. And, uh, and they were exempt from, uh, you could not uh, take their homes from the Levites. It was, uh, I, I, I don't know, I, that's 32. Okay, that, I was going to say, I knew that uh, yeah. I was going to get they there. given cities. Cities, there it is. As their inheritance. Yeah. As the cities of the Levites, the Levites have a permanent right of redemption for the houses of the cities, which are their possession. Verse 32, everybody. The, the Torah law that we just looked at was probably leading up to that security for the priesthood. Yes. So, yes. And it's interesting to note that the way the cities, we learned this when we were up on Megiddo. Yeah. Uh, the term down, uptown and downtown comes from this very idea here because the uptown was always built on top of the hill and surrounded by a wall. And that's where the king would live or the city king, the, the nob nobility, the rich people downtown was down the hill a little ways outside the wall and it became vulnerable to enemy attacks so whenever the enemy attacked it was the little peon guys they would run into the walls but all of their stuff would be yeah. confiscated and, and taken away and so they were continually losing out on that so the term up down and downtown it's where it comes from yeah it's 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 something that you know when you're reading the word and then you find out little things that we say and you know it's just like when we were in israel i think the first time uh, 
I don't know how many years ago it was, and they said the short end of the stick. Oh. I remember that and I, because, you know, the way they used to clean themselves when they went to the restroom and you didn't want to grab the short stick or whatever, because that was used for something different <laughs> that they said. So, you don't, you know, you're getting the short end of the stick, you know, and I don't, yeah. So, long end. yeah, you want the long end. <laughs> Peggy, take. Yeah. So, but, but, you know, you bring something up. You bring something up like that. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, there's something else I learned in Israel. <laughs> yeah, unless but, you're an Arab. They, the right hand of fellowship oh, wow. comes because the Arab people traditionally use their left hand to wipe their rear end. Yeah. So if you ever no. took your left hand, you didn't want to take you didn't want to take the right hand of fellowship. Funny where these sayings come from. Yeah. But, oh yeah. But oh yeah. So much uh yeah. there's yeah. truth and wisdom in it. You know? yeah. We've long since forgotten all that. Yeah. I mean you this is what you brought up when you made that comment. <laughs> Go ahead, Kathy. We're circling the drain. Use the <laughs> yeah. Use the microphone. You may not want me to do it because that one my teacher in first grade changed it from left to right. <laughs> <laughs> the left has always had a little bit of a stigma to it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's like when we. I'm in my right mind. <laughs> no, no, no. And yeah. I'm switching. So no. I get to use the ball. There you go. I'm not saying it's it bad, it's, but, it, but it has always had a stigma to it. Yeah. I remember when Melissa and Felix, well, Melissa asked if you know, they could come to our sa the Seder. I said, well, of course you could. So she says, uh, so she signs up and she's left-handed. I said, well, never mind, Melissa. I said, you're left-handed, you know. And she said, well, Felix is too, you know. <laughs> I said, what are the odds of two lefties getting together? And <laughs> so we had a good laugh. Oh, I remember reading that. Yeah. 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 Okay, you guys, let's move on. <clears throat> In letter A, no interest on loans to your fellow countrymen. If you were living, if you were a resident in the land of Israel and you were uh, an Israelite and you have fallen on hard times. Now, this is the first form of, uh, of, of uh, getting a loan. Let's say... Uh, What's that? Bank. A bank. Yeah, it's like, let's say you had a bad crop one year. Everything was going good, but this one time, mm -hmm. all you needed was a little help. So you'll get a loan, so you could buy the seed or whatever, uh, and that would uh, would get you, and then you get the crop, and then you pay the loan back. Well, you could not charge interest, you know, to your, your fellow countrymen. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and, and there's many times, we covered this earlier, that in Deuteronomy, it talks about, uh, about uh, some of the loans that were there given out. Because remember, the loan would, would, uh, would fall away at the sabbatical year uh, or, or the year of Jubilee. You know, it'd be, it'd be annulled. So they said sometimes, even when they gave a loan, it wasn't really a loan. It was more of a gift. You know, because they knew that, hey, in five years or four years or whatever, yeah, they might pay you a little bit back, but it's, you're not going to get the full amount, you know, by the end of the sabbatical year. So you just get what you can, but the rest, but eh, forget it, you know, we're, we're good. All right. So that's uh, uh, in letter A, no interest on loans to your fellow uh, countrymen. And then in letter B, an Israelite would be hired a hired worker, not a slave. Okay, hired is the fill-in. What we're covering there is that uh, if an Israelite had really, this is the next level, and had to sell himself or give himself up as a as a slave because of a uh, you know he owed money or uh, or something happened, an un unfortunate thing would happen. Uh, if, if an Israelite brought him in, they were not to be treated as slaves. 
They were to be treated as a hired worker. And like I said earlier, I don't think this is a coincidence in the time that we are in right now, because we are going through the, you know, the counting of the Omer. We we're going through the prodigal son. And it was the prodigal son that said, you know, I would be better off as a hired worker for my father than I would be being a slave in this foreign land. So he went back home, you know, it, it, a, a beautiful uh, story there. Okay, now let's go to Leviticus 25.30. Oh, who? Oh, go ahead, Peggy. Kent, unmute yourself, Kent. Uh, Muslims in their countries do not take interest in their banks due to that uh, rule, I believe. I know that. that rule and the Tanakh in oh, the I Bible. The Muslims don't do that? Right. Oh. Right. Muslims don't take interest in their banks. That's their belief in their uh, uh, religious system. Yeah. But they don't want anything to do with Torah, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's where it comes from. Yeah. Right. Go ahead, Bruce. You have to remember that the Muslims, uh, Muhammad uh, came around in, in the 600s, 632 is when Islam was formed. Right. Until then, the, the people of Arab descent, their, their holy book was the Tanakh. Yeah. Then what they did is they added the Quran to it, much like Mormons have done with the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. they, didn't, they didn't get rid of the Tanakh completely, but they added to it. And the thing they added to it actually became more important to them superseded. than superseded, yeah. again, kind of like the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we have yeah. to remember that. So a lot of the Muslim, a lot of Islam faith comes out of the Tanakh because of that reason. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, in Leviticus uh, 2535, it says, uh, now in a case of a countryman of yours becomes poor and his means with regard to, your, uh, to you falter, then you are to sustain him like a stranger or a sojourner that he may live with you. The people are required in Israel to take care of the poor. They are required to, uh, to help them. Uh, in Leviticus, in uh, number one there uh, below B, it says Leviticus 2535, help your countryman who is poor. So, so it's not a, uh, I mean, you know, you're supposed to, you're supposed to help. Go ahead, Frank. You suppose that? You're that man, way. well, you know what? I say supposed to, but you're right. It's mandatory in Torah that in Israel that they help their fellow countrymen. And do you think it really goes on today in Israel? You're going to be homeless? I mean, well, you know, isn't it amazing? I mean, how many, I mean, and, and they're good, they're good, uh, organizations but how many organizations in israel are always asking us for for money to help the people there so i i think the problem in israel right now frank is uh militarily they need to keep up the military they need to keep everything because you know israel is one of those countries that uh if they lose a war they're gone you know there's a lot of Every war that they've won, uh, which is all of them, they're always uh, told to give back the land, give this back, you know, and, uh, and, and, and they do. But if they had ever lost the war, nothing would be given back to the Jews. They, would, they want them off. Do I, I, what I'm getting at is uh, so much money is spent on their military that there's not a, a you know, that kind of money should also be spent on the poor in their country. You know, as you're talking, I just got a brilliant idea. What's that? We should take, we should take the homeless and enlist them in the military. You are. You want them fighting? Well, I mean, they could go. They, you know. No, I know what you're saying because because how many times they've always said that. They've always said that about uh, people that are incarcerated, especially if they're young. Well, get them out of the jails and out of the prison and put them. Yeah. 
And that's not a bad idea, except, uh, you know, if they're not listening to, uh, you know, people on the streets or their parents or anything like that, you know, are they going to listen to their general? I mean, I guess they better. Uh, they, would. they would. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You know, but, but I always thought that that wasn't a bad idea. When I used to read the stories about that, where a judge would say, you either go to the military or you're going to be in jail for, or, you know, the next 10 years or something like that, oh, I'll go to the military. And then that changes the person, yeah. you know, so, yeah. Every 18 year old should automatically have to go to the I think that is, that is one law in Israel. Yeah, that would be, that it's would be. Up. They're all yeah. a bunch of babies right now. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Maria. Use the microphone. England used to do something like that. They would tell them, you can either go to jail or go to Australia. And usually they picked Australia. That's, that's yeah. where they got their population. But when I read this one, this portion was really good to, for me. When I read that we should take care of the poor as a commandment, I, I was thinking, you know, we in this church, we're black. Yes, leadership that takes care of the of the needy with sadaka. But I was thinking maybe if I pledge my 10% as God wants me to, maybe there should be a percentage that I should think about putting into the sadaka instead of saying, well, I have an extra, mm -hmm. I'll give it to sadaka. Maybe we should no. start thinking 10% to God and maybe two, three percent to Sadaka. Well, and, and I'll tell you this, uh, you know, we talk about the Sadaka that goes out, the, the 60,000 a year or whatever. A lot of it isn't what we, that's what we brought in on Sadaka. What we've done is we've given away all the Sadaka back, you know, in, in to those who need it, but we've also have also some of the, the tithe mm -hmm. will, uh, put into the sadaka, so we've done it like that too. But I'll tell you one thing: I don't have a problem. In other words, Peggy, what I'm saying is, uh, is uh, if somebody is in need, but the sadaka they came in at like two hundred dollars, but the person needed, uh, but we wanted to give away four hundred dollars. Well, where do you get the other two hundred? Well, we would, you know, we add to it. we'll add to it. That's what I'm saying. We'll add to it. So uh, this congregation has been doing that for uh, for a while now, now, and we're going to continue to to help those in need. Uh, I don't have a problem. Before I take on a question, I don't have a problem myself uh, when I go to uh, your your uh, Kmart's or wherever, and there's a person out there. Well, <laughs> well. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we're <laughs> well, wherever Walmart, Walmart, or whatever. And you, you always have the. I always say, no, I always say thrifties. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but I don't have a problem not giving them anything that the people are out there asking. Hey, would you give to this, you know, cause or whatever? And I, what I tell them is, I give to my congregation. Mm -hmm. I said, and the congregation helps out with that. I said. Uh, there's only one organization that I do give, and that's Salvation Army, because Salvation Army is the one organization where that money goes right back out to the people. It's not like only, you know, like like 40 percent of what they take in covers overhead. That isn't the Salvation Army. Salvation Army is very minimal amount covers their overhead. Everything else goes right back, right back out. So uh, was somebody else going to say something? Uh, Gary? I was just wondering, those that we help. Yeah. Have any of them ever said, hey, can I come down? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Can I come down and rake up leaves, pick up some trash, clean up around the ground? No. Anything like that? Or um, take it run? Not, not often. Not often, Gary. You need to get there. Yeah, that's true. But there are some that then when they're doing better, they give back into it. We see that happen. Yeah. We do see that. We also do have a widow fund now in this congregation that we give to 
regularly. Yeah. Okay, let me uh, finish up here. In letter C, Hebrew word for countryman can also mean brother. Okay, so when we read countryman, the Hebrew word, word there can also mean brother. And then in letter D in Leviticus 25.43, we are told, do not treat a servant harshly. Okay, you are not to be cruel to a servant or, or, or a slave. <laughs> okay, and then in letter uh, E, we're going to wrap it all up. The Israelites could relate to slaves because they were once slaves in Egypt. Okay. And they are constantly reminded of that. God is constantly reminding them that you were once slaves in Egypt. And that is our Torah study for today.